Last week we started a, a conversation on sincere love, and that was a really good time in the Word, and it was really good to be encouraged about um, sincere love, and, um, and today we're going to continue that, except for it's going to be sincere faith, and as I was thinking about this, you really can't have love or faith and it not be sincere. Um, well, specifically love. I think you can have an insincere faith where you just kind of put on and like you, you, you have, they call it lip service, where you say the right things, but then the fruit and the, the, the actual byproduct of your life would say otherwise. Do you know anybody like that? Don't nudge your person that you're sitting next to, but... Um, you know, we all, we all make great boasts about what we believe in and what our life is all about, but then uh, the truth is that our life would, is supposed to m- marry what we say, right? It's supposed to be a, a, a merged thing where what we say, our life matches that. Um, what's been painful for me is as, as I've been studying sincere love and sincere faith, I just find out how human I am and just how gross... Um, my life can be sometimes in the sense of I, I make a lot of statements and I make a lot of boasts about who I live for and what my life is all about. But then when I start dissecting my life, it's like, man, I just, um, I, I, mean, I need to be more quiet and, and start living intentionally so that I can actually, so that my life matches what I say. Um, it's not like I'm a hopeless case or anything, but I'm just saying, you, you start digging into some of this stuff and you're like, man, I got, I got a long ways to go. And so in this conversation with uh, Sincere Faith, um, we're looking at a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, and it's the second, second Timothy, so it's the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, and, and there is a special relationship that Paul had with Timothy, and I don't know if this would capture where you're at in life, uh, but Timothy, Timothy and Paul were different in age. Uh, Paul actually looked at Timothy as a son. Um, We don't know what the age difference is. All I know is that in the first letter, Paul says, don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth. Um, In the second letter, we don't really know what's going on in Timothy's life, but we do know that he is struggling with what he's doing because Paul writes these very poignant statements about, bro, let me tell you what I see in you. Let me remind you of who you are and what's been spoken over you. Now go live these things. And um, and so maybe, maybe Timothy had ministry burnout. I don't know. Maybe it was just life burnout, where he's just tired of loving people. Have any of you ever gotten that point? Where you're, just, you're just done loving people. It's time to love myself. There's just so many dysfunctional, needy people around. I'm just going to just love me for a minute. Um, but we have this letter, the second letter to Timothy, where Paul writes um, just really direct statements to remind him who he is and remind him what his life is is to look like. And, um, and so we're going to look at that. We're going to go through it verse by verse and, and take a look at this sincere faith. Um, we've prayed. We worship. We're ready to hear what God wants to say to us. Y'all ready? All right. Let's, let's get uncomfortable together. Here we go. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read it straight through verses 5 through 14. All right? I am reminded of your sincere faith. We waste no time getting into the theme of the message. He goes right to it. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift God, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God or the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality. Uh, He brought that to light through the gospel. Verse 11. And if 
this gospel, I was a, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now, sometimes I just read things and I just read it and I don't really think about the why. Um, children, they go through these phases where they, um, they ask a lot of why questions. Anybody that has parented a child or grandparented a child, you know that season of life where like, why? Why, 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 why am I here? Where? It's not even just limited to the why, but where did I come from? Uh, just, just a slew of questions, and their, their mind is just full of wonder and full of why. Somewhere along the way, we lose that as if we had arrived at knowing all things. But I think it's continually important for us to ask the why question. Why is Paul writing this letter to Timothy? We, we don't know all of it, but what we can kind of see through these words is that Timothy has hit a spot where he needed to be encouraged. He's hit a spot where he, potentially he's lost sight of who he is. Right out of the gate, Paul says this in verse five, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. This faith that I see in you is a multi-generational, transactional faith. I saw this faith in your grandma, and I see this faith in your mama. And that same faith that I saw in them is in you. It'd be pretty safe to say that Timothy was a mama's boy. He's saying, I, I see this. this. This intentional faith transaction between generations. This, this isn't the, the whole focal point of the message today, but I want to take a sidestep and speak to anybody that um, would be considered an elder. I don't know if it's 55 and older. If you're just older than somebody, this is for you. I said, it, I said it well in the first service. So that's the tricky part about two services. I just want to make sure I hit it the same way. I don't want you to minimize your influence in other people's lives. Let me, let me specifically talk to those who are 55 and older. Don't minimize your influence in other people's lives. Specifically, as it pertains to faith, even if the kids and those that are younger than you aren't yours by blood, there's still the opportunity that God can give you to have faith transactions where the faith that you have in you can be transferred to the next generations. Now, when I, I grew up, I, went, I call myself, I have like a calico upbringing in the sense of I went to a lot of different denominations growing up at least four, maybe five, but it's, just, it's very eclectic growing up. One place that we landed was in Assemblies of God Church, and I don't remember a whole lot. I remember the, the, the vibe, if you will, of the church services. It felt really big um, in, the, in the services. I remember feeling God there as, as early as six or seven years old. I also remember falling asleep on the seats and then waking up during worship and being like, hey, God's still here, and then, uh, anyways. Um, after the church services, though, I don't know how I discovered this man, but there was an old man who had um, red hots in his pocket. And I remember just being so anxious for the amen at the end of the service, and I would just bolt out of the sanctuary and just find that man. And there was, there was in addition to the red hots, it was... There was a graciousness and a kindness and a Jesusness about him. When he would look at you as he's handing you a piece of candy, and he's just got kindness all over him. Now, I don't remember his name, 
Um, I, don't, I don't know where he's at today. He may be with Jesus right now. But I remember that from him and thinking, you know, when I get older, I want to have that much kindness exude from me. He didn't even say a word. He might have said a word like, hey, only one. <laughs> um, but, but there was no sit-down lesson that he gave me or anything like that. He just was intentional about having his pockets full of candy every Sunday, and kids would just swarm him after church service. All you 55 and older, build it into your personal budget for Red Hots or something. <laughs> and love on the kids here. Y'all, we have 90-some kids on, on average back in, uh, in FF Kids. If you can't move around, if they're too fast for you, just trip them with the walker that you have or something. Just slow them down. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to talk to you. Let me help you up. But love on them. Don't let them just run past you without you just extending the kindness of Christ to them. Because you're... The, the lovingness that's over you, the, the walk with Jesus that you've walked out, it needs to be transferred. And I would love for Paul, if he were to write more letters, I would love for him to say, man, all, all you old people at Family Fellowship, you're, you're doing a phenomenal job transferring your faith and just doing that handoff. Keep doing that. Let me make it super practical for you. There, there are a lot of faces in here that you may not know. Just go up to some of them and say, hey, uh, throughout the 80 years of our life, we've accumulated some really awesome recipes, and we would love to have you over and try some of those recipes for you. And just have some people over that you don't know and bless them over a meal and conversation. Amen? Okay. He goes on after he acknowledges Timothy's sincere faith and that it was a multi-generational faith, he goes on, and what we have to do as we read this text, we have to put on some lenses where, we're, where we see, where we constantly see sincere faith. From this point on, everything that Paul writes is in view of Timothy's sincere faith. Does that make sense? For this reason, for the reason of your sincere faith that I see, you may have lost sight of it right now, but I see it. As I'm reminded of your sincere faith, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is the only time that I've disagreed with the majority of commentaries that I've read. When they talk about, when they address the gift, um, the gift of God, the majority of the commentaries that I read, they were focusing on the gifts of the Spirit and, and like the, the ministry gifts and things like that. And there's all these just pages of stuff about the gifts. And I'm like, I, I don't think that's what he's talking about. Fan into flame the gift of God, the gift of God, which was given to you by the laying on of hands. He's talking about the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, fan into flame the Holy Spirit in you that was given to you by the laying on of my hands. Clearly, Paul, during a ministry time, if you will, church service, revival service, we don't know, maybe they had a fish fry and a revival service. But Paul laid his hands on Timothy and prayed, Jesus, I pray that you would fill Timothy with the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, however many years later, Paul is writing him saying, fan into flame the gift of God. Now, different translations will read it, um, you use a different word. Some of them are, uh, one that we just read, fan into flame, stir up, rekindle, ablaze. Now, the question for me as I'm reading this is like, yeah, that sounds great. I want, I want the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to be alive in me. I'm gonna fan into flame the gift of God. How? How do you do that? <sighs> Just blowing on my heart, my soul. <laughs> is, that, is that what you mean? Obviously not. We don't, need, we don't need to hand out fans and fan yourselves. What do you what do, you do to fan into flame? Now, now, the reason why I also believe that it's the Holy Spirit is because if you're 
If you're mildly familiar with Acts, Acts 1-8, Jesus had told the disciples after he was resurrected, he, got, he said, hey guys, hang out in Jerusalem, and in a little bit of time, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on you, and you're gonna receive power to be my witnesses. You're gonna receive power to be my witnesses. Now, when that happened, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, it says that um, there appeared to be tongues of fire that separated and rested over each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Why else would Paul say fan into flame? the gift of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to live the lives that we're called to live. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. There's no other way around it. Fan into flame. Well, how do we do that? What, what does that fanning look like? You know what? I, I feel like a lot of times it's, just, it's, it's going back to what we heard in youth group. If you ever attended youth group, or it's those early disciplines that, that are handed off to you. Um, read the Bible. If you're not reading the word, you're starving yourself spiritually. And I'm not getting old school on that of like, whatever old school looks like as, as it pertains. Some people think the Bible, reading the Bible just seems really legalistic and boring. It's not. The Bible says of itself that it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And so if you're not ingesting the life of the word, you're starving yourself. Find people that can see Jesus in you and can speak to the Jesus in you and keep on encouraging you. I love having people in my life that can just continually remind me, hey, I, I see this in you. Remind me of my identity in Christ. And they can also remind me and point out the non-Jesus stuff in my life. Hey, there's a lot of Josh in that. Not so much Jesus, but a lot of Josh. That's fanning into flame. Throughout the course of my life, there are definitely both men and women, but there's a growing list of men that, that I, just, I just love to be encouraged from. And they, they fan into flame what's in here. Worship. There's a, reason why, um, there's a reason why I don't care what you think about me when I worship. Because I'm worshiping him and not paying attention to what you think of me. And so when I move off rhythm and clap off beat, I don't care. That's me fanning into flame. And when my hands are stretched out before him, that's me saying, um, right now I'm an easy target and I'm completely vulnerable before you and I want you to know that my life is in your hands. What that does for me is it reminds me that I'm not God. And it reminds me that I need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit every stinking day. Amen. So fan into flame the gift of God that was given to you by the laying on of my hands. And then he starts giving the specifics about that spirit. He says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That verse right there, I wish I had the voice of James Earl Jones when I read it. <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> Just like, oh, he's not given us a spirit that causes us to shy back. Remember, Paul is addressing Timothy's sincere faith. It would appear by word of mouth that Timothy's faith was waning, and Paul is saying, bro, you have sincere faith. Get that spirit in you, the spirit that doesn't cause you to be a wimp, but that gives you power, love, and self-discipline. then you won't be as tired as what you are right now, and then you will be able to fulfill the call that God has placed on your life. You won't get tired loving people. Amen. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. This is the same, this is this Greek word. I know you didn't come for a Greek lesson, but it's dynamis. 
This word literally means that he gives us the power to do that which we can't do on our own. If you can give yourself the credit, then I would really be skeptical of the Jesus in it. Y'all, have you ever noticed that when you read the scriptures and you go through the Old Testament and you see the different things that God would do through people, you know what they would often do? Moses, he found a stick. God says, throw it down on the ground. And he throws it down on the ground and it turns into a snake. And he says, pick it up, pick it up, and it turns back into a stick. Hey, Moses, stick the stick in water. Does Moses do anything except for put a stick in the water? He didn't make the waters part. God did. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. God healed people. God caused a drought. God caused things to rain. It wasn't man. And I know this is a really bold statement, but man, how, how many of us really want to live our lives where when we're on the, towards the end of our life, we can look back and be like, okay, all of that was God. I was set free from a stronghold. I want to be intentional about not using the word addiction because addiction is hopeless, but stronghold can be set free. I've been set free from a stronghold. That's God. I'm doing things and speaking places and loving people in places that I would not ordinarily have gone. That's God. All we have to do is show up. I love it. You know what's confusing to the world, to the rest of the world, those that that are really trying to figure out God? You know what's confusing is when somebody professes to be a Christian, but they're really timid? It's confusing. What sense does it make if the God who created all things and has all power, if he lives in you, if you're... What sense does that make? The way we should be causing people to scratch their heads is by the undeniable power of the living God in us. Okay, hold up. So I've been around church, been around church people a lot of times, but, but that person over there, they're living for God in a whole nother way that I've never seen before. Like I see God in them. They're confident. They're not arrogant or cocky, but they're confident. So that spirit does not make us timid. But that spirit gives us power. Power to do what we couldn't ordinarily do on our own. Love. This isn't the light, fluffy, romantic love. This is sacrificial, not superficial. Love. A love that would drive Jesus to die on the cross. That kind of love. So when the spirit is in us, we can love in a way that doesn't make sense. And then he, he talks about, and I don't know why he throws this in there. Maybe Timothy had self-control issues. I don't know what Timothy's issues were, but he says the spirit of God that's in you gives you power, love, and self-discipline, the ability to discipline yourself. Moderate your life, all of your life. Moderate your words, moderate your attitude, moderate your actions. The spirit of the living God gives you the capacity to moderate your life. What's funny is I mean, this could have just been second Joshua because this letter feels like, I feel like it's addressed to me. Let me give you an example of self-control or self-discipline. So yesterday, there's a group of guys that just started working out, and yesterday was our first day. I'm in a lot of pain today. It's not even like the good pain of working out. You know how sometimes you work out, you're like, oh man, it just feels good to hurt. This doesn't even feel good. <laughs> My legs are so sore right now. <laughs> After the workout, I went straight to Kudrowski's. <laughs> and 
And I brought, I bought 12 donuts. Not three, one from me, Summer, and Aubrey. I bought 12 for me, Summer, and Aubrey. <laughs> There's four left. Self-discipline. I can joke about it and smile about it, but if we actually get into the word, Jesus has quite a bit to say about glutton. <laughs> I'm just saying, being gluttonous. I can smile about it, but it's a for real issue. It's a for real challenge. It sounds so hokey to say this, but I need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to snoogles. <laughs> I mean, seriously, why does the guy who created snoogles need to live right here? I learned that he has a patent on that thing. Seriously? You have to eat them, right? I mean, I always went on the way of like taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> but self-discipline. Now here's the why. All of that was explaining the what. Fan into flame, the gift God gave you. All of this fosters sincere faith. Here's the why. This is so powerful. It's not only the why, but it's the what. This is what sincere faith is. All of this spirit in you matters, and we pick up in verse eight. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as a prisoner. I have to think that Timothy was getting a little bashful about Jesus. Have any of y'all ever done that in public? When, when somebody's giving you a hard time for believing in God, you believe in God? That, that must take a lot of faith. Like how can you live in this world and see what's going on and say that God exists? And, and I don't know about, maybe you're not verbalizing it, but maybe in your heart, you start to kind of do this thing where you just kind of slowly, if I walk back slow enough, they won't tell that, they can't tell that I'm retreating. Paul tells Timothy, don't you dare be ashamed of Jesus. And not that it's a, we, we act based upon how he acts, but let me just make this statement. Jesus was not ashamed of us. While he's breathing his last breath on a cross, he was not ashamed of us. He has saved us. Actually, I skipped a verse. It says, rather join with me in suffering. Sincere faith is a willingness to suffer. Sincere faith is a willingness to suffer. I learned this from a member in the first service that the word sincere, this is, I hope I articulate this well, but the word sincere came, I can't even tell you what era it came from, a long time ago. When pottery, pottery would accidentally be broken and they would piece it back together uh, with wax. And, and they did such a good job piecing it back together that you couldn't tell that it was never broken. And to distinguish the pottery, um, pottery makers, potters, would, <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> You know, pottery makers, <laughs> otherwise known as potters, they would put, they would put a, um, a stamp on the perfect pottery and says, it would say, without wax. Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell what was true and what was false. Sincere. The only way that you could tell what pottery was cracked or perfect was through heat. 
Is that not profound? So the sincerity of your faith, the cracks of the sincerity of your faith will be tested in the heat of life. I mean, I had church in the narthex between services. I was like, that's good stuff. Sincere faith. So he goes, don't, be, don't you dare be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Rather, join with me in suffering. Join the suffering. Be okay with ridicule with slander, with the cross looks, with the skeptical looks. Be okay with all that because the gospel is going to invite suffering because there's going to be people that don't understand it. There's going to be people that are angry at truth and refuse truth, and so they're going to want to pick you apart and try to find your cracks so that they can shout, ha ha, told you, not legit faith. Verse nine, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, a life that is not the norm of what everybody else is seeing and experiencing and watching. He called you to a different life. And this isn't because of anything that we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now it has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is is why I'm suffering. Yet, this is no shame or no cause for shame. And listen to his resolve. Listen to Paul's resolve. Because I know whom I have believed. I don't care what people say. I don't care the comments that they make. I don't care what insults they hurl my way. I don't care what objects fly my way. I will willingly suffer for the cause of the truth of who Christ is. Because if I give in, that means that I'm not living for truth. Jesus is either who he says he is or he's not. He's either crazy or he's Jesus. I did this in the first service. I went too fast in the reason for us or the, the byproduct of us being filled with his spirit in this life being willing to, to suffer all of this. You, you know, we live in this world where so many people are so eager to play the victim, so eager to take offense and be offended. Colleges having cry rooms They bring ponies in so they can pet them. I don't understand. And I'm not slandering or anything. I just legitimately don't understand. Like I was, I mean, I dropped a popsicle, like a full ice ice cream cone thingy when I was a kid, and I cried over it. I didn't get another one. That's devastating to a kid that loves ice cream. But we we live in a world where if you cry long enough and hard enough, you get a pony to pet. (laughs) When the Holy Spirit is in us, we, we live by a different code. And when troubles and difficulties come our way, without the Holy Spirit, we tend to ask questions like this. God, where are you in all of this? Like, with an attitude. Where are you in this, huh? Or God, why is this happening? 
But when, when we live, when we fanned into flame the gift that God gave us, we ask questions like this in the face of adversity. God, how can I bring you to this? God, how do you want to use me in this? There's no victim in that. There's an understanding that you are a child of God and that you have, you've been put here for a purpose. Start asking different questions. We don't throw tantrums, we bring truth. We don't have outbursts of rage, we walk with buckets of grace. That's the difference of those who live by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on, after he's given Timothy these encouragements, he says, this is why I'm suffering. I've chosen to live for the truth, and I'm not ashamed of the suffering. Verse 13, when you, or what you heard from me, keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. In 14, he concludes this portion. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The good deposit is the truth that Paul passed on to Timothy. Guard it. Those of you that are new to your faith and you're new in this journey, the things that you're getting, the truth, the word that you're getting, guard that stuff. If you're just, yeah, whatever. If you're just kind of loosely juggling it and not letting it take root, that's sad. It's a sad way to live. But let the truth do the truth's work in your life. And in time, you're going to look in the mirror one day and you're like, okay, so... I don't recognize that person. There's a kindness in their eyes. There's, there's a lovingness in that person. You're not being vain by making self-observations. I think it's actually important for people to see in themselves the transforming work that God is doing. And not only that, and we're, we're already, it's so fun to hear these stories where husbands or wives, when, when their spouse begins to pursue Christ, and, and you just hear different stories where it's like the, the husband or wife will say, you know what, you're, you've not been as agitated with me as what you normally are. Or you've, you, you just carry yourself different. Or you, you talk to me differently. Children take notice. Co-workers take notice. And it's not a song and dance for them. It's just the transforming work of God. Y'all, let's let Paul's letter to Timothy do the work that it did in Timothy do in us. If you're tired of loving people, fan, fan the flame of the Holy Spirit in you. If you're tired with your spouse, maybe you need to withdraw and just Fan into flame the gift that God gave you. Maybe you're tired of your boss. Maybe you're tired of the drama in our world. We, we have to, amen. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit in us to live the life that we've been called to live. That's sincere faith. This morning, the, the question appears simple, but it's probably a little bit more difficult to answer this week. But how will you be bold? That's really what um, the power of the Holy Spirit does in us. It gives us boldness. But how will you be unashamed? How will you be sincere in your faith this week? Go beyond just, I'm going to read the Bible more. Or I'm going to just, don't, don't limit it just to yourself. How are you going to be bold or unashamed this week? Maybe you encounter people on a regular basis who, who mock you for your faith. This week's going to be different where you don't shy away. 
It's not a matter of stepping into a combative situation. I'm just saying don't, don't shy away from the truth of who you live for or the fact that you live for truth.